see here. Dr. Lee, you are back. Yes, and I can finally see you. I haven't seen you until just now. <laughs> can you see my slide? I can. Okay. I'm going to go back now to the title slide. Can you see my title slide? I can. It's very small for me, but I can see it. Okay. Well, I can make it. I can make it big for sure. A couple of different ways. That's a. Oops. Bring it back. That's the easiest. So I can make this solo and big. There we go. Let's double check. All right. Now it looks like we are running live. Now it's working. I'm getting a now it is working starting now. Okay. So looks like there was a small glitch. I'm going to unsolo that so we get back in. This is where I think uh, early sci-fi did it, did yeah. us a disservice. And now, no now we're, now we're back. Back. So wondering what was see. going on. Let's see if I can make yeah, this Apple bigger, Android. brighter, bolder, and better again. Let's try this again. All right. I'm going to bring this over here. We see my, I'm just going to see if we can make this better. All right. We're going to stay there. I'm going to make my camera better. So you're not looking up to me. There we go. That is better. Justine, how are you now? Good. All right. Well, we'll start over because I want to do this right. Get this right for everybody. So it looks like we are back on track. All right. So I want to welcome everyone to today's Vecro webinar. I'm very, very sorry if we had a couple of a little uh, AV issue, but it seems that we have fixed it. So welcome everyone. You can go ahead, please, and type in where you are logging in from from around the world. We love to see it. We have now well over 100 people on with us, and we have Dr. Lee here with us as well. So as we quickly go through our housekeeping, the both first Dr. Lee's. First, <laughs> first they, both Dr. Lee's, that's right. First things first, thank you so much to Merck Animal Health. They are an amazing educational partner for us. And thanks to them, we're able to provide this completely free, complimentary, race-approved, live and, and interactive YouTube live event. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health so much for being here and a, being an amazing educational partner with us. Now, how are you going to get, as this is a live and interactive YouTube live event, how are you going to get your CE certificate? There are two ways. One is you can type in you, that little website address we have on our screen, tinyurl.com forward slash and then VG for Vet Girl. Today's date, 7 10 23. Or using your fancy smartphone camera, go ahead and put it right up to that QR code. You'll see a little button pop up and our little, so you get there, there it is, our form to go ahead and fill out that form. We'll leave this open until 2 p.m. Eastern today. So you have about 45, 50 minutes to go ahead and do that. Justine will later put that into the browser as well. So you see on our YouTube that link to help you out. As this is on YouTube, on some of those YouTube pages, it can be a little bit small. If you click that open box in the right-hand bottom corner, what you're going to see is it becomes full screen. No matter what device you are using, whether it's your phone, your computer, whatever it is, it'll become full screen for you. We do hope you are interacting with our entire platform, not just our YouTube live events our certificate programs. Now we have 11 certificate programs that are part of your Vet Girl membership. They are not additional in cost. Your membership counts for all of this. So whether you want to become more proficient in ophthalmology or nutrition or emergency medicine or anesthesia, we do hope you're taking advantage of our certificate programs. They're a lot of fun and again, a great way to become more proficient in an area that interests you. We did just change our Vet Girl platform where if you've not been a Vet Girl member before, you have the opportunity to have a completely free 14-day trial membership. You'll be able to watch anything you want in our on-demand library for 14 days so you get a sense of our style, how we teach, the opportunities out there. You cannot take quizzes to get your CE certificates. That is limited to full-fledged Vet Girl Elite members, but you can watch our events See if you like our membership. We certainly hope you do. And then decide if you want to join after our trial membership. And if you've not signed up for our Vet Girl U conference, I certainly hope 
you're going to sign up soon because number one, our conference is in uh, just over a month now in sunny, amazing Scottsdale, Arizona, but we are almost sold out. I think we only have just two or three technician spots yet left and not that many more veterinarian spots left. So if you were interested in sitting on that fence of do you want to go to Vet Girl U? The answer is yes, of course you do, but please do not procrastinate anymore. Make sure you sign up and register ASAP before it is completely sold out. With that said, again, thank you to this Dr. Lee, although I want to thank the other Dr. Lee as well, but thank you to this Dr. Lee for being here with us today. Dr. Lee, if you can give our audience a little bit of a background about who you are, I, I know you're out in that beautiful West Coast, but where you are, what you love doing, and then please take it away. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for that great introduction. Yes, my name is Christopher. I'm a preventive medicine specialist with Merck Animal Health. Uh, I get the privilege of going and talking to veterinarians, technicians, other professionals, and talking about parasites, vaccines, immunology, all the fun stuff. So I love the fact that I get to do that. In my past life, I was also a uh, practice owner, owned two hospitals in Arizona. And like Garrett, I used to live in Pennsylvania. And while I do love sunny California, I miss the fireflies. So with that, let's get started and look at Vaccinology 101. With Vaccinology 101, we are only going to be looking at a small snippet of today's um, entire program. We'll be focusing on chapter six, which will be looking at vaccine types, handling, and storage. If you want the full uh, experience of the entire program, reach out to your Merck Animal Health representative and they will help you get that scheduled. So with that, we are going to move on and get started in talking about vaccines. Would it surprise you that vaccines save, you will save more lives with vaccines than antibiotics you prescribe? It is one of, it is the most life-saving single act that we do in our profession uh, to help save pets. In addition to that, not only are you saving the lives of pets, but people as well. Every time you're giving vaccines for zoonotic diseases like leptospirosis and rabies, you are helping save the general public. You're reducing the overall shed and exposure of these pathogens. And for all of that, we're also going to be reducing the use of antibiotics, an important thing uh, for sure. When we think about who makes vaccines and who is in charge of them, it is important to remember that this is uh, overseen by the Center of Veterinary Biologics, which is part of APHIS and underneath uh, USDA. When we think about human vaccines and we think about human drugs and veterinary drugs, that is, of course, going to be the FDA. Now, when we think about what are the requirements, USDA requires that all vaccines are pure, safe, potent, and efficacious. And you may sit there and think, well, gosh, if that's the case, it sounds like they're all just a commodity, right? I mean, if any vaccine is going to be safe, pure, potent, and efficacious, then gosh, let's go for the cheapest price. Well, I would caution you on such, such thinking. Uh, when we think about that, uh, while yes, they do have minimum standards, there can be ranges on depending on the vaccine. When we take a look at certain antigens, sometimes uh, we do have companies where we all make things fairly similar. And yes, I still wouldn't call it a commodity, but I suppose that you could say, let's look at pricing. With many vaccines, though, uh, from combinations to overall efficacy, there can be wide, wide ranges. Um, I think one of the best examples would be feline leukemia. While the efficacious standards are really uh, for the USDA measured in weeks, what we require for our patients can be measured into a year or sometimes two years. Um, when we think about some head-to-head -head studies, there's actually a, a wonderful head-to-head -head study that looked at a couple vaccines on the market and a placebo and a four-month challenge. One of those vaccines did not be, was not statistically different than the placebo, which is scary. So I would not say that they're all created equal. And when we think about AFP guidelines, right, all kittens, it's core for all kittens. Uh, they're going to get two doses. Then you're going to have a booster at a year. And then at that point, it becomes lifestyle. If they're high risk, you want every year. If you are zero risk, you do not want to give. And everyone in between has been recommended a two-year protocol. Would it surprise you that there's only one vaccine out on the market that has data at two years and a two-year label? And as you probably guessed, 
It is the Merck Animal Health Novavac FALV. So with that, moving on to let's talk about vaccine type storage, handling, and administration. Certainly, when we're thinking about maximizing these vaccines, whichever one that you choose, by understanding these principles, you are going to end up be maximizing both the safety and the efficacy of your vaccines. When we think about routes of administration, you may wonder, well, why is that so important when we think about maximizing efficacy? Well, when you think about intranasal and oral vaccines, I kind of ask you to think, are those modified live? Are they killed or inactivated? Are they combinations? What do you think? Well, as you probably uh, know, they are all modified live. And one of the key uh, changes, reasons that you know that, is that when you look at it, it comes as a little cake, right? It's what we call lyophilized or freeze dried. And that lyophilization typically means that you're going to have a modified live, something inside of that vial, or something very fragile. In the case of intranasal and oral vaccines, we are going to have either as the sole component or an important part of the vaccine as a live Bordetella bacteria. Thus, if we have patients on antibiotics, we need to be delaying the use of these types of vaccines to maximize the efficaciousness of the vaccines. When we think about injectable vaccines, again, that rule still applies. If it's freeze-dried or lyophilized, that means that it has something living or fragile in it. And if it's pre-made as a liquid, you know that everything's inactivated. Now, it could still be subunit um, or whole cell, uh, even engineered, but we know that that's going to not have something active within it. It does say uh, sub-Q or IM. In the old days, many of these vaccines were licensed at IM. But for the pet space, uh, now they're all, thankfully, sub-Q. Uh, but still, sometimes people will give them IM. Examples of these, of course, you're, for intranasal, you could be thinking like the Novavac Intratrac um, 3 that you're placing into the nose. Uh, all of us uh, are probably very familiar with oral Bordetella vaccines. This has become um, very popular. Uh, pets like it so much more. Uh, but the, one of the big challenges with oral vaccines is, of course, that uh, up till now, it has only been Bordetella. And we know from AHA guidelines and many studies, the importance of parinfluenza. So if you haven't tried it, there's a brand new vaccine out there, everyone. It is um, Merck Animal Health's Novavac Intratrac BBPI. And that is going to be both Bordetella and parinfluenza. Kind of a really cool uh, option out there. And for injectables, of course, there's some half volumes and full volume vaccines, always full dose, but some of them have various presentations. And we may think of something like HCP or what is also called FERCP. When we think about proper custodianship of vaccines, one of the most important concepts is cold chain. And we'll talk about what that range is for cold chain. But from the moment the vaccines are created until they get into a patient, we need to make sure that they are being maintained within a very close uh, proper temperature range. Now, much of this is going to be done uh, by the manufacturer and the distributor. But once it uh, lies up onto your doorstep, from the moment it is onto your hospital to the point that it gets into a patient, that is your custodianship and responsibility to maintain cold chain to maximize the safety and efficacy of those vaccines. So we're going to have a few scenarios and we're going to be meeting Dr. Hugh Morrill. Dr. Hugh Morrill, she is an absolute lover of vaccines and immunology, as her name would probably suggest. So when she's thinking about how to make sure that she's properly storing vaccines in her hospital, she is going to be training her staff. She is going to be establishing uh, proper storage and handling SOPs and identifying a primary vaccine coordinator, someone else inside of that hospital that loves vaccines as much as she does and is willing to take on um, that responsibility. Now, during a break, Dr. Hugh Morrill uh, sees that there's been a vaccine delivery. So what do you think is the gold standard on how um, her clinic should be placing the vaccines? Should it be like option one, where they're kept uh, neatly into the bottom, maybe in those handy drawers? Should they be all um, collected together in the center of the refrigerator? 
or as an option three, a spread out um, amongst the refrigerator. So I'm gonna give you a second to just think about it. And we don't need a drum roll, but let's go ahead and show that answer. Oh, let's go back. Did that not build? All right, well, that's okay. It is option two. Um, this is a little bit of a Goldilocks scenario for thinking about the vaccines. Option one has the risk of becoming too cold. You never want to have them in the bottom of the refrigerator. Uh, and on option three, that has the potential to become a little bit too warm, especially for those vaccines on the door. What we want is them in the middle of the fridge with plenty of air around them for circulation. And ideally, you should have a thermometer on there that measures minimum and maximum temperature ranges um, within uh, that area. If you don't have one of those thermometers, you can buy them on Amazon or Home Depot at Lowe's for approximately $25, or reach out to your Merck Animal Health rep representative. They may have a special solution for you. Now we talked about cold chain, but what is the proper temperature for cold chain? What do you think that temperature should be? Now, again, this is where vaccines from the moment they're made up within minutes of delivering the vaccine, we want it to be kept at, we can reveal the answer. It is going to be 35 to 46 degrees. We do not want it to get into the freezing range, which is why B would be very incorrect because we're gonna have ice crystals be forming within that um, vaccine and that can lead to a loss of efficacy and a potential increase in risk. Same with C and D, those could be too warm. So we wanna make sure that we're always maintaining between uh, 35 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, Dr. Humoral, here she is. Um, she has drawn up a DAPPV vaccine and her last patient of the day is Lily, 10 year old Beagle. But for reasons um, that we won't go into, Lily was not able to be vaccinated today. So if we advance to the next part, what does she do? She has no more appointments for the day, yet she's drawn up a DAPPV for proper cold chain and to save that vaccine. Can she put it gently back into the refrigerator in the center or must she discard it? What do you think? And that's right. She needs to discard it. You have one hour from reconstitution. This is very important for um, especially uh, lyophilized or those cake vaccines. We're thinking about the DAPPV those envelope viruses are very sensitive. Uh, by the time you get to the two hour mark, you have considerable loss of distemper. So you will start with a DAPPV vaccine and whether you keep it on the counter or in the fridge, no matter what you do, once you've mixed it up, if it's not gone into an animal, it goes from a DAPPV to an APPV to an APV, APV, and it just gets worse from there. So absolutely a one hour to get that into a patient. When we um, take a look, the day has gone on and a vaccine delivery has arrived at Dr. Humoral's clinic. The vaccine coordinator, however, opens it up and she realizes that they're no longer cold. What should she do? Well, as you probably guessed, she is going to need to be calling that distributor. We can go ahead and advance. And it is important that they never get too warm or too cold. Uh, and the time of deviation, the moment you've gone out of cold chain, the amount of time is irrelevant. This is represents a risk to both safety and potentially to efficacy. So at the end of the day, um, the, one of the technicians uh, at her hospital is counting the vaccines and notices at the back of the refrigerator, there have been a few that have started to freeze. What should she do? Well, as we've discussed, um, we need to be not utilizing those vaccines. Anything around those vaccines would also be a concern. Freezing represents one of the most dangerous things that can happen to vaccines because those ice crystals expand, can damage uh, components within the vaccine, leading to increased risks with safety and decreased potential for efficacy. So we've talked about some don'ts. Well, what about some do's? Well, some of the do's would be uh, all we always want to make sure that we're adhering to label, label mixing. And I think I'm missing a few slides here, but that's okay. Um, one of the first things that's also a to do that we need to make sure 
is that we're ma maintaining um, proper sterile um, handling techniques. We want to make sure that we are drawing this up with sterile uh, situations. When it comes to label directions, this also becomes a situation where I think sometimes it becomes a little tantalizing. We often have, let's say, a DAPPV trays in our fridge, DAPPV with lepto combos in our fridge, lepto standalones in our fridge, and we start scratching our heads going, wouldn't it be kind of cool to just use the combos and then I can just kind of use them separately and I kind of make it all easier in my fridge? No, emphatic no, don't do this. And there's several reasons as to why we don't want to do this. First of all, it's not always consistent, but with some companies, um, what is a standalone diluent uh, or um, combo diluent or standalone vaccine, they may have uh, differences within it. And the one that difference is designed to mix with, with the cake. Additionally, with that, um, often when we're looking at then using a cake by itself, people will grab sterile water from a tank. Um, that has been showed repeatedly across multiple com companies uh, to lead to abscessation. So not something that we would want to do. And it also typically is going to void warranties and guarantees from the company. And anytime that there's issues with concerns of lack of efficacy or adverse events, we always want to make sure that we're maintaining communication with those vaccine companies and often there's support from them for, uh, for the client. One of uh, the other two slides, I'm sorry that we're missing them here. Um, one is that we want to make sure that we're looking at those expiration dates. Expiration dates, um, they are important. Um, there's a lot of science that goes in to make sure that those expiration dates are there. And again, we want to make sure that we're providing that full guarantee, best medicine for patients with both safety and efficacy. Uh, next slide. Now, I, I'm probably pretty sure that you've never had this happen. No one's ever walked into your hospital and said, come on, doc, my little dog's so small. Can you just give half the vaccine? <laughs> Right? It's like, no, we probably hear that, uh, gosh, like every week or month, people are coming in going, he's so small, can he just get half? Um, again, the answer is a very emphatic no. Um, it is very important that we give the full dose. Vaccines are based upon immune system. It is one dose per immune system, not going to be makes per kg dosing. And one of the facts that I always like, and it helps, I think, people get more comfortable with this concept, uh, and it also helps answer another question, is that one of the USDA requirements before any cereal lot is released, so a cereal batch, right? And that is done not when these vaccines were made, whenever they were made. No, for the vaccines in your fridge right now, within months of those being able to be ordered, that cereal batch, doses have been given to laboratory beagles and or cats, depending on the species. And we give, every company must give 10 cc's, 10 doses, all in one spot. Big old syringe, pop it into a laboratory beagle or a cat. If you've ever met a laboratory beagle, they're super cute, but they are not your average beagle. They are usually about 12 pounds. They're very small. So when you're thinking about this and you're worried about the chihuahua getting too much, know that for the vaccines in your fridge, samples of those, uh, 10 cc's have been given to little 12-pound beagles, and they've been just fine. Um, so the worst case scenario of giving a full dose is really, again, just you're doing great medicine. But if you give less than that, uh, we risk of the vaccine not working. And now we have a patient and an owner that thinks that their pet is protected, and yet it may not be so. And this answers that other question. Again, I'm sure this never happened to you. You get a little wiggly dog or a little wiggly, wiggly cat, and a little bit of the liquid gets onto the fur. You're like, oh, what do I do? Again, we'd want you, every company would want you to call them, um, get direction. But as a general rule, the answer is going to be to give another full dose. Because we know that your average size cat and a little 12-pound beagle, they can handle 10 cc's of a vaccine. So at most, 1.9 um, is going to be safe. And what is important is that it's also efficacious, where when we start dropping below a full dose, that's when we run risks of lack of efficacy. So when we're looking at answers between the big dog and the small dog, or we're looking at 
a little bit of vaccine falling out, rest assured that this is safe. And what we want to do is also have that other part of that pendulum of being efficacious, which means at a minimum, we want a full dose given. Obviously, don't ever give 10 cc's of a vaccine to any pet, um, but know that, that that is there. With um, shaking, again, should they be shaken? Always look at the label most of the time. Yes, we do want to um, shake them. We want full mixing of the vaccine. We want both that from a standpoint of just a uh, liquid. We don't, sometimes uh, aspects can settle. And certainly when you are combining, we also want to make sure that there's good mixing. So whether you're combining it with the lyophilized or it's just a standalone liquid, make sure we're shaking. All right, so a few other questions that we uh, that Dr. Humoral comes up with. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next case uh, that she has. So Fluffy has been boarding, will be boarding in a few weeks and came in yesterday for kennel cough vaccine. Okay, I, I admit, I, I wrote this question, but I don't know in 20 years of practice that that ever happens. To me, the owners bring them in on the way to the boarding facility, but but in a perfect world, right? They'd be coming in a few weeks early, so that would be that would be awesome. Um, however, during this um, scenario, uh, Dr. Humoral's patient history, she found out that Fluffy is currently on antibiotics. Should she give the intranasal or oral vaccine? Well, as we discussed a little bit uh, earlier, the answer would be not recommended. Reason is that the board of telefraction may not work because we're using a live bacteria in the face of a patient on antibiotics. Next, we have Dexter, a five-year-old, 50-pound golden retriever, uh, was in to get his vaccine boosters. When collecting the history, the owners noticed that he's been bombing, lethargic, and not eating too much. Dexter is overdue with vaccines, and we know it's the most life-saving single thing that we do. So do we give those vaccines? Answer is not right now. We need to get an underlying answer to the vomiting, the lethargy, the hyperexia, have those solved prior to giving vaccines. We don't want to make um, Dexter worse, and those vaccines may or may not work in the face of the underlying cause uh, of disease. And we have Ollie, a 10-year-old black lab who came in to see Dr. Humoral. Um, for an annual visit, and he's always been so good being kept up to date on all the vaccines, uh, but the owner doesn't really want to give Ollie any more vaccines because, after all, he's kind of too old, Doc, right? I think he's good. Should we recommend vaccination? Yes, we believe in germ theory. It does not differentiate between old and young, and in fact, um, those older patients represent a vulnerable population. On the human side, if you go in to get your flu vaccine, you may notice that it is very common for people after a certain age to get a higher dose of vaccines, not less. And being one of the uh, older generation myself, um, I had that talk with my doctor when I was told that I was of a certain age, which made me cry. But part of that talk included other vaccines that I did not get before. And we can go ahead and um, do three clicks and just kind of bring out these different types. We don't really have time to get into this, but I would say that if you're not able to quickly answer what is type one, two, three, and four hypersensitivity, I um, brush up on it. And an easy way to do that is to reach out to your vaccine uh, manufacturer representative, such as Merck Animal Health, and get them to give you a quick little refresher. Um, all these companies have great professional services veterinarians, uh, and we are always happy to come in, talk, and revisit those. By understanding the different types of hypersensitivity, we better understand how to manage them, what to look out for. One of my favorite things to remember on this is I think everyone is very familiar with type 1 hypersensitivity, the anaphylaxis, dog swollen face, hives, pale gums, maybe uh, collapsed. But what is the number one sign for calves? What do you think? Think about that for a moment as to what the number one sign for type one hypersensitivity is for calves. It is vomiting. And that is a very um, 
important to, uh, thing to bring up with training, especially for that front staff, right? There's always that, that joke of, oh, ma'am, you have a bombed a cat? Well, congratulations, you have a cat, right? And certainly we should never be thinking that, but in the face of a pet that just got vaccines, that is not a scenario where uh, anyone should be telling an owner, go ahead and watch, and if it gets worse, come back. Absolutely not. Cat is vomiting on the way home or goes home and vomits after receiving a vaccine that day. That could be a sign of type 1 hypersensitivity. Reason to come back. So again, these are some of the simple things as to why uh, we need to be remembering what all of those types of hypersensitivities are. In summary, uh, develop those SOPs and protocols surrounding vaccines um, to help ensure consistency. Your veterinary healthcare team, we want to make sure that they have the ability to inform and talk to pet owners. Again, having owned hospitals, I um, paused our um, day practice uh, Wednesday late morning for a few hours. We had a very extended lunch. One of the things that we did was role playing. Yes, I did get death threats, but but um, we did have a team that properly educated those pet owners. So as much as my staff did not like that, it did make them better at what they do. Embrace uh, role playing. Um, it is just part of it. Yes, it's not fun, but it is how we get better at what we do. And it is through communication that we also help save lives. Finally, um, you always want to understand immunology and vaccinology for the betterment of our patients. There's a lot of great resources out there. On the next slide, you will see and remind that there's AHA, AFP with SABA guidelines. The biopharmaceutical companies such as Merck Animal Health are also there to help you. And with that, we'll open it up to see if there are questions. Wonderful. Dr. Lee, that was amazing. Really appreciate it, especially um, the review of type one through four. I always uh, tell people when we lect when I lecture, cats are so unique. Again, that rare, rare, rare uh, reaction, it can be quite scary. So knowing that vomiting is the number one sign is so important. All right. So everyone, um, I would love to see your feedback. So if you enjoyed this, you loved uh, getting half an hour of free CE, please make sure to type in your comments now. Uh, I always like to uh, pass these on to Merck and Mahal, so make sure to uh, shout out any uh, kudos uh, to Merck directly, and I'll make sure to pass that on. A uh, couple of questions that I see. Uh, before we get to questions, I did want to mention again, I posted it multiple times in the chat. Please make sure to fill it this survey. It's going to be open for like another 20 minutes. Um, so stop what you're doing. Fill out that form right now. It's in the chat so you can get your CE certificate. And that's for you watching it live. Uh, if you're a Vet Girl member, you can always watch it later on our website. All right. A bunch of great questions. So you talked about some great scenarios. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think the biggest misconception was, uh, or one of the biggest questions that I often will see, and again, I don't do vaccines, but even I, I worry about this. What if as you're trying to give that vaccine and like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 mil shoots out through the skin or accidentally, if anything comes out, are you giving another full dose? Um, so that's one of the first questions. And I apologize. I believe we just lost... Dr. Lee, the other Dr. Lee, uh, Christopher Lee, but he should be coming back soon. Um, I see a bunch of great questions. So let me just ping him real quick. In the meantime, again, to get your CE certificate, please make sure to go ahead and copy uh, the tiny URL. It's backslash VGL, uh, VG71023, today's date for CE certificate. This will be open for another 20 minutes. So again, please make sure to type that in and we will um, make sure to get you your CE certificate. Let me check to see if uh, Dr. Lee is back. So Garrett, uh, let me uh, just ping him real quick by text. No problem. And also a reminder, I think he is coming back in. So let me just see if he pops in. I'll click on show stream and Dr. Lee there we are. Dr. Lee is Sorry, back. it's strange. I could hear you, and then I realized that I wasn't coming through. No worries. So, uh, Dr. I Lee. hear the question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, one of the questions was, you know, when you're given those great scenarios of what to do if, you know, the vaccines freeze or they're completely thawed, what about when 
any small amount comes out. So say you're, you know, injecting it sub Q, you're aspirating it back and like 0.1 mils comes out. Um, do you, what do you do in that situation? Yeah. Another full so, And we certainly think like, oh man, it's only 0.1. Well, that's 10% of the dose that we need to stimulate an immune system right? In a, in a one mil vaccine. So we would recommend that you reach out and talk to the uh, biopharmacal, uh, biopharmaceutical that made it. As a general rule, yes, it is going to be giving another dose. And that is why, again, we have that safety study. Um, every time a serial batch is released, what is in your fridge today within months that has been given at 10 times the dose to a average size cat and typically about a 12 pound beagle? So I'd rather you err on the side of giving 1.9 vaccines and know that we have efficacy than to give less than a CC and potentially we have a pet that is not protected. Great. And some of these diseases, again, remember, they can be zoonotic, um, they can, uh, can be fatal to people. And with rabies, you may not be getting another vaccine for a few years. Exactly. Great point. Now, what about, I know a lot of uh, general practice practitioners will do this where they pre-draw the vaccines um, as a pet comes in. What if the vaccine has been mixed and it's been an hour, it hasn't been in the refrigerator, but it's been sitting on the counter waiting for the owner to come in. What if it's not used within that one hour and it's already reconstituted? Yeah. The moment you get to the one hour mark, whether it's refrigerated or not, it should be discarded. Up until that hour, um, you can just sit it on the counter. That's fine. Uh, but after an hour, you start to lose fractions of efficacy and potential risks to safety. Okay, great. And again, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, now, another one. What if someone accidentally drew up something else? Like they drew up saline instead of the diluent. Uh, what do you do in that scenario? Yeah, do not use. Um it is very specific, the diluent that is designed for those vaccines. Uh, we don't want, again, it's just like chemistry. It's not the time to be creative. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Now, I will say um, my own dog, who is ever since he was a puppy, um, my general practice, my general philosophy is to practice the way I do on my own <clears throat> pet. And I live at the head of the Mississippi River, uh, were massively flooded in the spring in Minnesota. And even my dog, uh, who's 11, is annually vaccinated for lepto. <coughs> I'm retentive. I have it on my calendar, so I know uh, when to rebooster. But for one year vaccines like lepto, Lyme, Bordetella, what if the owners are late? Like it's greater than 15 months. Uh, one question is do we have to restart the series and booster again in two to four weeks? And I'm going to add a follow up question. What about how do you encourage compliance and follow up for that booster? Yeah, great questions. When, now in the old AHA guidelines, there was some very clear recommendations for that on when you needed to restart boosters. In the current guidelines that were just released in October, if you haven't read them, go out and read them. Uh, it is always important to be keeping up with that. And they are leading you back to the manufacturer. So with that, we would want you to contact the manufacturer. Again, that's what your uh, vaccine reps are for. They're there to help give you that up-to-date information. So it's always gonna be a little bit different. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant just to uh, answer that question because while we do have a nice standard answer, uh, sometimes things can change. So I would want uh, just from an evergreen perspective, reach out to your um, vaccine company. But there is leeway. There is Great. Leeway. Thank you so much, especially since it's on the internet. We want to make sure uh, people are staying up to date. All right. I see a couple of great questions. Um, first of all, how do you approach that anaphylaxis in a cat? I will say as a criticalist, uh, you brought up a great point that as soon as you see that vomiting, the owner, CSR, tech assistant, everyone has to be educated. It is really, 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 really rare to see a reaction in a cat. But when you do so, see that vomiting, what do you do yes. then? So as a preventive medicine specialist, I know that whenever possible, I have amazing criticalist specialists right there with me. <laughs> I'm going to put that question to you. <laughs> no problem. So happy to talk about it. Uh, sorry, I just had to unmute. So uh, I always tell people, cats don't have time to develop that urticaria, that puffy face. Uh, when you see that, you should think of paracetamol or acetaminophen toxicity. Uh, they don't have time to do that. They vomit, vagal, 
and uh, become critically ill. They become tachypnic and rarely, 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 they can actually, it, it can result in demise. So as soon as you see that, um, you probably heard like most of the time, criticalists nowadays are minimalist with steroids. Well, in this situation, we want to reach for um, our medications. So I usually will do 0.2 mg per kg of dexamethasone, sodium phosphate, IV or IM. Um, then I, and again, if that cat's really dyspneic, do all your medications IM to minimize that stress intramuscularly. Um, I will go ahead and use a Benadryl or uh, injectable diphenhydramine. So typically two to four mg per kg IM. Ideally not IV because rarely we can see severe hypotension, hypotension. Um, but if they're really critical, you can um, give it as a slow IV bolus. And then in severe cases, I would do epi, um, epinephrine. And this is not the CPR dose of epi. So I look it up every single time you have time um, uh, within the next couple of minutes to do that oxygen therapy. Um, and remember what the shock organ is in the, in the cat versus the dog. In the dog, it's the gut. Um, so in the cat, even though they vomit, their shock organ is the lung. So I would actually hospitalize that patient uh, for a couple of hours uh, just to be on the safe side. And again, it's a very, very different reaction. Uh, so important to know. All right. A um, couple of other questions. How late can a puppy or kitten be before starting the series over again? So starting the series, it depends a little bit on what we're talking about, right? When you're looking at the modified live vaccines, um, often these can get uh, three, four, five, even six doses of the DAPPB, depending on when you're starting, the frequency and the end. Um, if they were very late, you would never give that many again to start with. Um, the new guidelines recommend two doses if you have a dog that's uh, older and missed those. With those inactivated vaccines, uh, lepto, Lyme, CIV, those are going to be two doses. With your intranasals and oral vaccines, those are always one and done. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Two more questions and then we'll, we'll call it. Um, and again, I just want to thank all of you guys for showing up for today's uh, lecture. I love how veterinary, uh, veterinary professionals always want to learn whether or not it's over a lunch break, over breakfast, over coffee. Um, and let's be real, most of the time we don't get lunch break. So we really appreciate you guys uh, coming up to learn. And again, please fill in your survey. It closes in about 10 minutes. All right, a couple of really great questions. You brought up MLV, mo modified live vaccines. Is there anything else you should avoid while giving a patient a modified live vaccine? Like, can they get Cytopoint, an immunosuppressive, antibiotics? And my follow-up question, because a lot of people were paranoid about this personally when we got our COVID vaccines, could you take ibuprofen or NSAIDs as a human? Um, and if NSAIDs or prednisone has to be prescribed post-vaccination, will that affect the efficacy of the vaccine in the pet? Right. And great questions. As a general rule, how I would break the answers up is, is the injection leading to a change with the immune system? For example, high dose steroids, high doses of uh, pred, uh, prednisolone, prednisone, yes, that is absolutely going to potentially reduce the efficacy of the vaccines. When we take a look at the other, vac other uh, possible injections, Benadryl, non-steroidals, typically we do have some data to show that that is not interfering. With other things, again, like Cytopoint, um, and again, in full disclosure, I used to work for, for Zoetis. Uh, Cytopoint's a wonderful uh, product. Um, there isn't really studies out there to show what, what happens if we do that. There was some safety studies for Cytopoint that showed that being given with other things that everything was fine, but not necessarily the what's happening to the vaccines. However, when you think about that, Cytopoint it is not interacting with the immune system is providing as with any monoclonal you're providing antibodies but that is not directly suppressing or changing or really interacting directly with the immune system so really it's going to be your immunosuppressives um prednisone cyclosporine etc those are the ones that we need to watch out for wonderful thank you so much it's super super helpful all right, um, and let's do this last question, uh, Benadryl. Now, 
one thing that has always amazed me, and I'm not just saying this, is uh, the true research and development and science-driven nature behind Merck Animal Health. Um, and I just wanted you to bring up, just so we know, um, statistically, what what are the vaccine reactions? Um, are they different between vaccines and in like that patient that may have had an adverse event and a reaction before or dachshund? Um, are we pre-medicating or do do you recommend pre-medicating with diphenhydramine? Yeah. So when we're looking at the overall numbers, you have to be a little bit careful. And if you look at one company and say, well, what, what is this number and what is that number? Uh, if they're not head to head, it becomes very hard to um, compare. Also, when we think about overall numbers, when we take a look at pre-launch safety studies, those numbers are always statistically a lot greater than what we see with vaccines in first launch. If you take a then look at pharmacovigilance or you look at something like the Moore study that looked at 3.4 million vaccines and what that response was. So a little bit of is contextual. What is nice is every year, all the companies, uh, they are always sharpening their saw. The vaccines that we use today from all of the companies are better than they were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. So they're always, always improving. Uh, with regard to Benadryl, um, that's also why I say go back and make sure that we're understanding the type 1, 2, 3, and 4. It is very helpful with pre uh, preventing type 1, but not going to be so with 2, 3, and 4. So part of it is when we think about reactions, we need to be understanding, is this what we're trying to prevent, a overall anaphylaxis? Or is the owner saying, yeah, my pet gets sore, grumpy, and grouchy? Benadryl's not going to hurt. It may make them all sleepy but it is not going to reduce that. So that's why it is important to understand what are we trying to prevent? Wonderful, thank you so much. Again, we always wanna be uh, data-driven, science-driven and uh, evidence-based, so thank you for that. Uh, with that, I just wanted to close out today's uh, YouTube live event. Again, a huge thank you to Merck Animal Health for sponsoring today's talk uh, with Dr. Christopher Lee. And again, please remember to thank your Merck rep the next time you see them and to make sure to fill out that form, uh, which will close in just a few minutes for real. So fill out that CE certificate uh, form, that form to get your CE certificate. And with that, again, a huge thank you to uh, Dr. Lee, the other Dr. Lee, to Merck Animal Health and to all of you guys. And we will see you at the next YouTube Live. And thank you for your patience with the uh, uh, tech issues in the beginning. And we hope to see you in person uh, one of these days. Thank you all so much.